so hopping back into the slides. Um, the, uh, the topic on making your own items is in the, uh, the whole next section. So it's going to be uh, a little while, but we'll get back to how to create your own item, what alias properties are, how to make an interface, and, and things like that. Uh, right now, we're going to go back to talking about data models. We've already seen using a static number as a data model. We've seen using a JavaScript array as a data model. And now we're going to find out that there are some conveniences to easily make data models so that you have like roles and different properties in one particular element, not just an array of Booleans. You can actually have deep data. And then you can display them using uh, lists. So um, there are two models that are exposed for your use um, that have pure data in them. And one is the list model. And it's simply a list of elements. And those elements can have n number of properties each. So it can be pretty uh, dense. Uh, but it's a general linear list. It's not a tray or a table. There's also the XML list model, which is going to allow you to take in a XML document, set queries on the XML document, and create a list of elements that way. Um, there are also models that contain both data and how that data should look. Um, and these are called the visual item models. So the most basic model that you can make is a list model which simply contains n number of list elements. So you might have a data model that's pre-populated with a few dozen elements. And the list element does not have a set of predefined properties. You are going to define everything. So unlike um, the abstract item model, where there was like the decoration, the display role, the edit role, all these predefined things, there's nothing predefined. You are going to make up your own like album, artist, song, track length, whatever you want for your particular item of data. Um, you can just do what you like. So for example here, we're making a name model that has list elements that have one property here called name. We could actually specify multiple different properties such as a name, title, rank, serial number. Um, you could have n number of properties in these. So it is it's usually very important that your list model have an ID. Because we're going to use that ID to assign it to a view, whether that view is a repeater or a list view or whatnot. So we're going to find out when we use this model, our delegates and our repeaters are going to have access to a magic variable called name when it comes time to construct their items. So in a uh, list view, there is a model and a delegate. This is much like how it works in C++ with the model view controller stuff. The delegate defines how the data should look and behave, and the model defines the data. All the view does is arrange the blocks of data. It really isn't anything special at all, but handling scrolling is pretty much all it does. So here we have this thing called component. And inside of a component, we call it the name delegate and has some text. The component item is a very special um, non-visual item. What component does is it makes a dynamically instantiable item. When this is processed by QML, there is no text item generated. However, through the component, you can generate n number of text items. This is how the list view is going to create its delegates on the screen. Because it's going to create 10 delegates if 10 things are visible on the screen. Then it's going to reuse those delegates as you scroll. So components are used when making delegates. They are also going to be used when you want to dynamically instantiate your own objects in your own time, whether it's using loader objects, or the components create object method. So you could also use the list model in a repeater. So instead of using it in the list view, 
we are simply going to say, hey, repeater, here is your model and here is your delegate. So now it is going to make n number of text items where the text is equal to name. So there is this implicit binding between the model and the delegate. These things are really going to go hand in hand. Because the data that you make up in the list element, such as the name property, is going to be used in the delegate component. So here we're binding text simply to name. So these things are often going to go hand in hand. When you build a model, you're going to build a delegate specific to that model. And uh, we can do this with a, uh, a repeater, we can do this with a uh, actual list view. So list model has a JavaScript interface where you can append onto the list, you can insert into the list, you can remove, and you can actually move items around the list. And append actually takes in a uh, little hump that looks like uh, JSON notation that is going to make an element in the list with a title attribute, and maybe it's using line edit.txt because you're allowing the user to dynamically add to that model. And these are calls from usually like signal handlers, like an on click, it's a little hunk of JavaScript. You can use the JavaScript API to manipulate the model. So uh, one thing that does not work, and this is a caveat for all of you out there, is that model properties can't shadow delegate properties. So um, the text item has a text property. And then we're also saying this element is a text property. Now those element variables kind of show up as magic variables. Like it's called name, you get to use name. If it's called text, you get to use text unless the scope you're in already has a, uh, in its namespace, a text variable, which it does because the text item has a text property. So this is a corner case that does not work. Just keep that in mind. So a uh, visual item model is one where you're basically um, making a model that is going to dictate not only the data contained inside of the um, inside of the view, but you're actually specifying how the view is going to uh, present that data. So here we have a, a visual item model called labels, which is a collection of rectangles, and we're just setting it to you know rectangle with a particular color, a radius, and it has a sub-element and text. It's more like um, you know, writing regular QML. Um, however, what we can do is we can say that this is the data model, and it has all these rectangles, but this data model does not specify how these rectangles are arranged. So it has some information about how what the data looks like, but to actually get it to stack up in a column, we need to basically use the column arrangement item and a repeater that uses the models. Here it's a visual item model called labels. It's going to provide the data and the items it's going to use to build that data. So there are two different types of views. Actually, there's three different types of views. One's not listed here. There is a list view, which generally shows things in a, in a list. It would be like your contact list in your phone, and you can scroll it up and down. And there's a grid view, which is going to display things in a grid. There is also one called path view, which can arrange items in an arbitrary path. So you could do things like cover flow. Uh, from the iPod is basically a configuration of path view. You can make your view a circle with path view and have the user rotate the circle around. Um, it's a very powerful one. 
Uh, most of the time, you're going to be using list views and grid views. So here's the code we had before. We had the name model and the name delegate. Very easy. And we use that with a repeater. Now we are going to add in a list view that has a model attribute and a delegate attribute. And we're also going to set clipping to true. Uh, it's going to be very common for you to set clip to true on your list views, either on the view or the view's parent, depending on the type of decoration clipping you want. Because you can imagine as you scroll Alice and Bob off the screen, you do not want them to go into negative coordinates. You want them to be clipped off. However, by default, it is still set to false because you could clip it maybe on some parent or grandparent if you had like a pretty rounded frame or something. So, um, you know, like cute views, you have to set the model. But unlike the C++ views, there's no default delegate and there's no default roles. This is all in your hands. You can do whatever you want. Um, and views are positioned like other items from top to bottom. So you can have a you know, list view with five things in it, ten things in it, or a hundred things in it. And the really nice thing about views is that it will only make enough delegates for what's on the screen. So as opposed to a repeater that will make n number of items one for each one in the data model. So if there were 100 things in the data model, the repeater makes 100. You could wrap that in a scrollable area, and it would scroll, but you have 100 items in memory. The list view has five items visible, and there's 100 items that aren't visible. It will only keep the five visible items, and will simply reuse those items with different properties as you scroll it. Um, something that's not listed here, but the cache size of the amount of items that it makes is, um, is adjustable. So if you're finding that you're not scrolling as smoothly as you'd like, you can actually tell it to make extra ones on either side. So you can set the cache size to 10, it makes five invisible ones above and below. So when you scroll, they're already pre-populated. There are uh, decorations that you can add. These decorations are also components. So you can have a header, a footer, and a highlight. And the highlight gets drawn underneath your delegate. So your highlight could be how you want your, when the item is selected, how you want it to look. And it's just like another component. So here we'll say that we're making a header, a footer, and a highlight. And we're just saying that header is going to be a rectangle. And if we wanted that rectangle to be really deep, we could wrap it in a component, just like we did with the, um, just like we did with the delegate. So if we go back up, and we see how the delegate, how does this keep going back here? See how the delegate is wrapped in components, and we can have children and all of this nice labeling. You can do the same thing with the header and footer. So you can either define them in line or use components. And here we're just doing it in line. We're just saying we want a header that's going to be a rectangle item that's pink and a footer that's a rectangle item that's light blue. And the highlight is going to be a light gray rectangle. Now the highlight is actually going to follow the current item in the list. So as you select items in the list, that highlight is going to move. And you can also adjust the speed at which the highlight moves. So you can say that I want the highlight to move over the course of 300 milliseconds. So rather than teleporting to what you clicked on, it'll actually slide up. And you can get really nice visual effects this way. Yes? Yeah, so, so for a list that has nothing selected, set the current item to negative one. Okay. 
Yes. So you mentioned the turn uh, living on for uh, the most view. Is that a performance issue? Because you were saying earlier that looking is a bad thing in general. Well, in general it is. Here it's necessary. So you need to have them done. However, they still leave it off because you might you might choose to do it in slightly different ways. Um, but um, but yeah. So the rule of thumb is um, clip as little as possible. This is required. So the um, the list view um, exposes um, itself to the delegates. So the delegates have this relationship with the view where the view makes them and manages them, and it manages them dynamically. So you're never quite sure who you are. Um, you do get some magic variables, such as index. You always have access to what index you are. You also have access to the list view. So you can say, list view, give me the current item. And maybe I want the text. Or maybe I want the current index. Is that equal to my index? Then maybe I should change something. Maybe when I'm in focus, my color text changes. Or when I'm the current item, really. There is also the um, concept of having uh, sections in your lists. So this is a, um, a tree-like type of thing but it's not really a tree. Uh, what you're doing is you're taking a data model, which is flat data, and you're basically going to arrange it into sections based on the data. So you can almost think of it as a micro pit, rather than being a true tree. So here, in your list view, there is the section property and section criteria, so you can decide what gets shown in each section. And each section uh, can have a delegate for its section headings. So for example, here, we're going to say, take this list view and make a section called team. And the section criteria is going to be, it has to match the whole string. It can't be a partial wild card or anything, the whole string. And our section delegate is going to be this rectangle that ends up saying the name of the section. And you configure these sections basically like multiple delegates. And what we'll end up with is um, this here. We're actually organizing uh, Alice, Bob, Jane, Victor, and Wendy by the, um, the, their section criteria. So we're adding in extra items to um, delineate kind of like a tree-like system. So if you want to have more than one item in your list element, you can have as many as you'd like. Like if we were making a playlist, uh, where you want to have all the songs that are on your MP3 player or something, it would be you know run uh, the length of the song, the name of the song, the album it came from, the artist, the year, whatever you want. And maybe these even have files um, embedded in them, so all be relative. <coughs> And this is actually what happens when you want to specify, say, an um, icon to be displayed. You'll have your uh, list model return the file of the icon that you want to display, and you'll set that as the source to a, um, an image in the delegate. So uh, for example, here, we're doing exactly that. We have this delegate, which is a column that includes an image and a hunk of text. We are um, setting the source of the image to be file. And we're also setting a width and a height on the image, because we want to constrain the image to uh, 64 by 64. And we're setting the smooth property to true, which is going to cause any scaling to be done with a smooth scaling algorithm. And we're also saying our fill mode, when we go to resize the image, is going to be preserved aspect ratio, or respect aspect fit. 
So when it fits into 64 by 64 pixels, it might lose some pixels um, on the top and bottom to make sure it stays the same aspect ratio. So we're using the file. We have file and name. We're using the file to populate the image, and we're using the name to populate the text. And you can go n levels deep on that. If you have this like data model that is all the songs, you don't have to use all of the roles. Um, it's there's no penalty to having extra data other than you have to store it. Um, you could also, in the same manner, use abstract item models that you export from C++. So grid view is much the same thing. It has a model, it has a delegate, you set clipping on it, and it will basically lay out uh, from left to right as many objects as it can fit in. Um, it's really not a table view, it's really a list view in icon mode, if you remember your uh, QT views. Likewise, you can provide a header, a footer, and a highlight. Um, out of the box, all of these lists are, um, are flickable. So what that means is that the user can actually put pressure down and give it a quick snap and it will kinetically scroll. Um, you can tap on it and it will stop. Um, these views are made for touch interaction. So this is basically the same example as you saw with the list view for header, footer, and delegate. Um, just the same thing but using grid view. So there is a, um, a lab that um, would normally be done basically to make this a little contact list. Uh, we'll go ahead and see the code and how it was built. But you can see that it has a header, footer, um, an icon, and some text but the current item is larger than the other items. And uh, this becomes something that's actually hard to do in something like QList view, and it becomes trivial to do in uh, QT views. You have to implement that yourself. Um, so um, there's actually not, not that many items in this little example, but you can see that the user can flick on it and it bounce at the end. But the idea here is that we want to have a list with Alice, Bob, and Jane. And it looks like the solution doesn't cover making the first one bigger. Yeah, let's see. So what we'll see is we actually have our uh, list model, which has uh, Alice, Bob, Jane, Harry, Wendy, and the appropriate icons, such as stars, knights, and uh, so on. So we have a delegate. Now delegates can be components, uh, or it just so happens that any item that's defined in its own QML file is automatically a component. So we could have taken this whole block in this component code out here, and just put it into a different file and call it like the uh, you know list delegates. Um, delegates are usually pretty complicated, and you can see here that we actually have a little state machine. So when our state is current, meaning when we are our list view is current item, then we are going to change our height to 44. Uh, I'm going to fix this as we go. Uh, rather than 
just fixing it? Could you show us how you would debug it and figure it out? <laughs> uh, good question. Um, <laughs> So anyway, let's run into the assumption that his setup is correct. And uh, I'll find the difference between two files. Um, so we basically have this component, and we have a state, and we have a when property. So this is combining things that we've already learned. So when our, the list view says we are the current item, uh, we basically change our height to 44. Otherwise, our height is set to 28. Uh, now, generally, when you're making list views, you're going to have your items make their own constraints as to their height. Um, it's not going to be something where, like in the QT views, there were the crazy size hints that could be set by the delegate or the model or some combination thereof. Uh, generally, you're going to set a constraint, and you might have that constraint switch on some particular items. You could also do something like, you know, you know, is current 28 or something. Uh, but then you wouldn't get the transition. So, and then it comes down to a, a text item and an image item. And the text item, just like in the slides, uses name. And the image is actually getting its source um, through a back door type of way. It's not using the file property directly. It is going to use the model API. Like we talked about the model having a JavaScript API. So here we're saying list view, get me the model that you're currently using. Models have a get function. For get at a particular index, we'll get you the list element at that index. And then we can use the attributes that we made up. So here we're using the JavaScript API rather than the magic variables. Both get you the same results then our list view actually becomes pretty simple. You can imagine this code without the delegate is really short. Uh, we basically make a view. Uh, we set clipping, we set focus. We set its model, and we set its delegate. And then we set the rectangle for the header, the rectangle for the footer, and the rectangle for the highlight. And this is very similar to exactly what was in the slides. supposed to get for any delegate, um, there's an attached property called list view. It's kind of like key navigation, kind of like um, in, uh, that, and the attached property start with a capital letter. Um, but we could actually um, do it the less generic way. Oh, that won't work actually. This would be have to be list view current item. Uh, 
Uh -huh. There's something wrong with the attached property for the list there. And unfortunately, that's probably in C++. So we have to crack open the PT source code to find that one. Any questions on views? Yes. What's in those nested? Like if you nest a created a list or yourself? You can. Um, I'll leave the caveat with at least on the cute interest mailing list. People usually complain about how the uh, keyboard focus works when it comes to that. Okay. You basically have uh, an item <coughs> focused, and then that item has a list. It's also in focus. Um, so um, I haven't I haven't done stuff like that, uh, but I uh, suspect there's some nastiness involved there. Okay. Uh, and then you mentioned that the list view is kind of vertically oriented. Yep. Uh, suppose you want to actually have it more like a film strip sort of path view. That would be path. Yeah. So the path view can do almost anything. Okay. Um, and you basically get to specify the path that the items follow by a mathematical formula. So you can make them a figure eight if you wanted to. Isn't that right off or I think there is. Um, I think that's the right. Let's see. If it's truly two dimensional. Well, it looks like there's no orientation. Here you go. Perfect. Property. All right. You can get away with that using that view. So XML list model um, is a, uh, basically a way to create a data model, a list data model, using um, XML data and X, XPath queries. So the idea is going to be that you are going to get your source for your XML list model either from uh, local files, from resources, or from HTTP colon slash slash wherever you want to go. And you're going to get a hunk of XML. Then your query is going to be a uh, XPath query. Here we are looking for all things that are items, and we are going to say for each item that it finds, we're going to have an XML role called title, which is going to give us whatever the uh, string of the um, uh, the string of the queried item gets us, and we are going to have a role called length. So basically, a magic variable that shows up that is going to be the results of the query looking for lengths and strengths. So basically what this is doing is it's taking an XML tree um, and it's going to parse it and it's going to use the XPath um, syntax to basically find items. And when it finds a matching item, it's going to add it to the list and it's going to then bind um, properties like name and uh, like title and length to um, subqueries basically get your string and maybe a sub tag and a string. This is very useful if you have like a web service that returns to XML. If you have a web service that returns things like JSON, then you might be interested in a talk that happens, I believe, on Thursday called Persistent Stored with QML, um, where Jamie Hicks is going to present a uh, QJSON DB which is a generic way of persistently storing JSON objects and fetching them from online sources such as Flickr. Um, so that's something that's coming down the path in the future. Right now you can deal with XML and XPath queries. So here's an example here of, um, you know, this query is actually going to go and seek out these items. And then it is going to basically use the string here, it's called Q, QT, and it's going to find an attribute called length and use its string for the length portion. So imagine if you, you know, fetch this from some web service and you had 100 items. Here we go. 
this becomes really, really useful. So when you're defining the delegate, you get access to those magic properties, just like you have in the list element. Um, instead here, you have, you have title and length. So they get defined slightly differently, but title and link show up as magic variables in your delegate. So basically you get to use the, oh, it's double here. So you get to use title and link in the, um, in the delegate. And this is basically the exact same way that list model works. So your components, and yeah, I mean your delegates and your view don't really care whether you're using XML list model or you're using Q abstract item model or whether you're using Q list uh, list model. And they're all they're all the same when it comes to the, uh, the views and the delegates. So all views are based on the flickable item. This is what gets you a scrolling area in QML. You can actually use the flickable item on your own much the same way that you use QScroll area in C++. Except the flickable has the, all of the grains and math in it to do the kinetic scrolling. The faster the user flicks, the faster it scrolls, and if it's moving really fast and the user hits it again, it'll bounce and stop, just kind of like the icon does. So there are a number of ways that you can customize your view. Um, one of these is by having um, your selection, when you move the current item, you don't move the selection highlight, you move the whole list. And you can do this with uh, strictly enforced or within a range. So what you can do is you can say that I want the current item to always be um, within the area of 42 pixels and 150 pixels. So that means as the user scrolls up and hits Harry, if he scrolls up to Bob, Bob is going to come down. And if you do strictly enforce, then uh, when Bob comes down and there's nothing above him, then the area that Bob has is blank. Um, if you do the non-strictly enforced, then when you get to the end, it will actually move outside of the range and highlight Bob. Uh, this is usually really useful when you want to have your views look like odometers, kind of like how the iPhone does date management, where you're moving the list of numbers um, up and down, but the one that's in the middle is the one you've selected. In that case, you would set a very tight Prefer highlight region and use a strict. Yes. Does it really make the highlight region less numeric and more tied to the height of each individual item? Yeah. Um, not that I'm aware of, and that has to do with the fact that the items can be different sizes. Right. So you can't say, "Oh, give me the fourth item," because depending on, you know, like, some items can be 44 pixels, other are 22, which we saw. Now, what happens when? Um, you want the fourth item, but you have three of them on the you know, screen that are different sizes. Well, I'm talking about like the preferred highlight begins to end. Yeah. You fix that at 42 and 150. So yeah. that's showing you know, three, you figure that out to be three items. I'm yeah. just saying what's like the average height of height or something like that so that when your graphic designer, whatever you move over, it changes the height of everything, and now you've got to go adjust that to be it. Yeah. Yeah, you could um, you could have it set on like um, like this graph design. You could set it to the height of based on heights of images, right. things like that. So had they change the image that is the delegate, it could change. But um, but yeah, it's based on pixels and not elements. Okay, did you mention it? Um, so views are pretty well optimized because they will only make the items that are on the screen and we will try to use them as much as possible. And um, there is a cache buffer 
which is the maximum amount of delegates to keep in memory. So if you have uh, want to add extra items that are off screen, keep them pre-populated so your scrolling is smoother, uh, adjust the cache buffer. Oh, it evenly distributes the extra ones on either side. Yep. So yeah, if you're going down, it's not going to put more down than, than up. Um, also, for performance, with, when it comes to anything, if you're grabbing your images from HTTP or something, and you expect them to be fetched over the network, they're going to be cached up to a certain point. Uh, but if you're going to be you know, whipping that thing around, um, you're probably going to want to uh, re-architect how you're fetching those images. Because fetching them off the web server is not going to make your scrolling very nice. They're not going to see, they're going to see a little blank images and then they're going to pop up. Yeah. Uh, 